Hello, hello, everyone. Hi, Deanne. How's it going? I'm good. How are you? I am also good. Um, I see that. Uh, hello, Tracy. So there's some people on the chat right now. So we are trying uh, this this week a new uh, way to. Um, to draw yeah, I don't want to create a loop here. Yeah, we're trying a new way, um, a new software. It's Demio. So we'll see if it's uh, really good, if it works good. Um, and then um, we're going to also be uh, using that software in the future. What I like about that software so far is if you do subscribe uh, to the Demio, um, it will send you a reminder for the next one, which is not now, uh, but uh, all the others. Like you'll have like a notification prior to the podcast so it's kind of um it's kind of good to see uh, that kind of uh, option that you can have um with the new software more user friendly so we'll see also if it's a uh, less glitch uh when it's live so you guys can ask question at any time uh on the chat it's not a problem uh if we don't answer it now that's probably because we know that we're going to talk about it during the podcast so we're just going to answer your question when we're going to get there, or uh, we're going to answer to your question at the end of the podcast. So um, feel free to ask any question to any of us like Gian or me. Uh, today, the topic is a shoulder dislocation. So um, we'll get to that in a couple seconds. Also, there's going to be some questions um, that we're going to put um, and also all the pictures that we're going to use today. I'll put it in the handouts. Uh, you guys can download the picture and keep it and see it for yourself if you want to. You don't need to look at our face the whole time, but uh, you can uh, also do that. But you don't need to if you don't want to because um, it's going to be uh, on the share screen also. So you guys will see our pictures. I'm going to show it to everybody. I think it's going to work. I'm pretty sure it is, but that's, let's see uh, our first demo um podcast so with all that said um we're i'm having a phone call let's block that <laughs> sorry about that uh let's start about the shoulder so um yeah so the shoulder uh, has the greatest range of motion of any joints in the human body our requirements uh, of the shoulder are very broad. We need to be able to fully elevate, uh, elevate it to perform overhead tasks like changing light bulbs, if you don't have a husband to do it for you, um, and painting the ceiling, again, if you don't have a husband to do it. Um, but we also require stability to, uh, to be able to perform a plank, for example, as a, a fitness exercise or push-ups or a handstands. Um, as well as a plyometric capacity like throwing things like obviously not throwing uh, a plates to your husbands that's not something we like to to try or to do but throwing like a baseball or a football or a basketball so it's really used in uh, multiple sports uh, because the shoulder is so mobile sometimes the stability is compromised as a result that the shoulder uh, as a result a shoulder dislocation or injuries that we deal with quite frequently. We don't realize how important the joint is until we uh, get injured um, and see how we become limited in our in our lifestyle. Uh, I think it's very important to know the capacity of our shoulder but also its limit to prevent the injury um, in that area. We have to know that our shoulder can be very powerful, but also very fragile at the same time. You'll see Dion will explain to you how we can dislocate a shoulder really easily. Um, but uh, we need to be aware of, of that limit. And even a simple task such as opening a jar or putting a key in a lock become really difficult when a person uh, uh, get impaired, uh, an impaired dexterity. Significant injury to the shoulder, elbow, wrists, or fingers can end a career or mandate a, a change of occupation or recreational involvement. We see this also in the military. Sometimes you're incapable of continuing your trade, so you have to uh, OT or make an, uh, another decision, even if you like your trade. So it's very important to 
prevent as much as injury as possible. So understanding the mechanics of injury will help you to better understand the program of intervention and prevention that are designed and implemented to you. So I, I hope that's, that's uh, going to be the results of it um, because me and Gian, we are working really hard to explain to you guys how to prevent um, the injury and why we are giving you that, that kind of rehab, that kind of re, uh, reconditioning program. So let's hope that uh, having that knowledge today, it will help you to better understand our process in our reconditioning or rehabilitation. So let's start by uh, learning the anatomy of the shoulder. So Gian, can you help us with that? I sure can. Here's a shoulder. So typically when we think of a shoulder joint, we think of the ball and socket joint, but that is only one component of the shoulder. The shoulder is actually made up of three distinct joints. So I'm just going to hold this up here. So right here is the ball and socket joint. We call this the glenohumeral joint. And that is the joint where a dislocation occurs in the shoulder. Above that, so on me, it would be the top part of my shoulder here. Above that, you can see here, this is where the uh, collarbone or clavicle joins with the uh, shoulder blade on the top of the arm. It's so called your acromioclavicular or AC joint. And when that joint's injured, we call that a separation. So there's a distinction between a shoulder separation and a shoulder dislocation. They occur at different joints. The third joint is our um, sternoclavicular joint, which you can only see one part of it here. I tried to mark it on the skeleton with a little pink thing, but I don't think you can really see it. But basically, it's where the, um, the clavicle and the medial end joins with your, your breastbone here. We also have some pictures, so... Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, Very you much. might be able to see it. Okay, sure. So... Um, the shoulder is very different than the hip, which is another ball and socket joint uh, in our body, and that the hip joint, the, the joint surfaces are very congruent. So the, the socket's very deep and the ball fits right snugly inside that socket. And that's why the hip has limited mobility relative to the shoulder. The shoulder, there's less of a cup, it's less, um, less concave, so it's shallower and the ball sits inside that. So that allows, again, like Francis was saying, for increased range of motion, but it also sacrifices stability. Um, so um, the stability doesn't come from the shape of the bones as much as it does from the uh, soft tissues that surround the ball and socket joint. So there are three layers of soft tissue that uh, we need to, to think about when we talk about the shoulder. The first is the outer layer, and we have uh, with three layers. We have a picture of that. Yeah, let me go get the pictures. So the most superficial layer, or the outer layer, this tends to be composed of large, powerful muscles, such as the deltoid, your trapezius, and your pectoralis major and minor. So they provide the bulk of the strength of the shoulder. So those, that, those are the muscles that you're using when you're doing um, gross motor skills, throwing a ball, that kind of thing. There you can see from the front, you can see the pectoralis and the deltoid there. So then the middle layer, that's your rotator cuff. And that, and it's a cuff with an F, not a two Fs, not a cup with a P. That's always a little bit of a pet peeve of mine. So this is from the front. You can see these are the muscles of the rotator cuff in the front and then from the back. So these muscles, as you can see, they make a cuff around the head of the humerus, around that ball of the ball and socket joint. So uh, there are five small muscles, they surround the, the bone socket joint and they keep that ball centered into the socket, which is really, really imperative for shoulder stability. Once the ball isn't centered, which we'll talk about a little bit later, it predisposes you to having some problems. So yeah, on these pictures here, you can see on the left, or the, the top left picture, on the left side of that diagram, those are the outer muscles from the back and then the shoulder blade muscles on the right side of that same picture, that's the rotator cuff. And then, yeah, the uh, the other muscle, or the other figures on there all show the, uh, the the middle layer or the rotator cuff. So the inner layer, the deepest layer of soft tissue, are the ligaments, which you can see on this model, that join the ball and the socket together. So again, like we talked about in the ankle presentation, uh, ligaments join bones to bones and provide joint stability. We also have, and I don't have a good uh, a good diagram that shows us this because it's so deep, but the socket of the shoulder joint is surrounded by a fibrous cartilaginous ring and it's called the labrum. And that also provides a great deal of stability to the shoulder. So that's part of that inner layer of stability. Do we have any more pictures, Francis? <clears throat> Let me oh, we did. 
no, we have the X rays. Maybe not. Already. Okay. All right. That's fine. So, Francis, if I remember correctly, you've had some first-hand experience with this type of injury to the shoulder. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah, for sure. Um, it did happen to me. Uh, let me stop sharing. <laughs> All right. It did happen on a personal note. Uh, it did happen to me in, um, in uh, my life, actually. I did uh, got a couple of dislocations on my left shoulder. I would say about a dozen. Um, and it, all my dislocated shoulders were, uh, made by playing sports. So, um, as I remember, cause that's a lot of like dislocation, but the first one was, um, actually all my dislocation was playing baseball, basketball, and rugby. Lucky me in baseball, I don't throw with the left arm, uh, because throwing the ball, you're going to be in a vulnerable position and then you're going to throw the ball. So might even end up your career as a baseball player if you dislocate the right arm um but it was my left one so i was good but yeah it, the, most of the time um all my injuries was happening by a force an exterior force that came on me uh for example like rugby um we were doing a scrum and i was like some somewhere below everybody and uh, somebody just landed on my arm that I try to go grab the ball so that was that was a really uh, hard uh, dislocation because the first one that I have was very 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 painful um, just because your 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 arms Jen will explain that uh, later on but uh, when you dislocate your shoulder your, sh your shoulder does not know what's happening right now so it kind of like create a force to put it back together but it's dislocated so it hurts a lot and it's kind of creating a pressure always a constant pressure and a constant pain um so i went to the hospital they had to drug me i if i remember they gave me morphine just to uh release the pain and release the the pressure and then they have to re re uh, re put the, the ball in the socket um so re put uh the shoulder back where it was and um, they do x-rays to make sure you don't have any fracture. I hope I'm not talking too fast. Uh, I mean, like, I'm not saying what you're supposed to say. But uh, what's really interesting uh, in the future was all my other dislocations, they were less painful. And even some of them, uh, I could re, uh, re-put together, like, uh, fix the dislocation myself. Um, it was not... It was not painless, but it was discomfort, but I was not in such pain as like I was the first time I uh, got my shoulder dislocated. So um, as you already probably know, uh, there are some um, career that or even professionals that are dislocation, uh, they are using dislocation uh, to perform in their career. For example, we can think out of the bat, um, a magician when he wants to, uh, um, use uh his dislocation shoulder just to perform a magic trick so uh, it's it's all right but um for most of career um having that kind of um, laxity in your shoulders will not help you at all so um but the first one you have will be most likely painful like i can remember but the more you have the more it's going to be easy to dislocate your shoulder also but um, reconditioning and rehab uh, can help you to reinforce that part, though. So, um, Gian, if I didn't say it, what is the recipe to dislocate your shoulder? And please, everyone at home, don't try it. Well, a normal shoulder joint, a good analogy for it is a golf ball sitting on a tee. If there is a large enough force in the right direction applied to the arm, the ball will dislocate or the, the golf ball will move off of the tee, for lack of a better word, resulting in a dislocated shoulder. So the shoulder is most vulnerable when we're in an outstretched position to about 90 degrees and few backwards, and then the arm is flung backwards for some reason. So another player landing on it, that, that will obviously do it. But the most vulnerable position of the arm is like so. Um, so significant damage occurs to the joint with a shoulder a shoulder dislocation, particularly to that inner layer. And that's one of the reasons why subsequent dislocations aren't as painful, because that inner layer has already been torn and stretched, so it will have more give to it. So there's less tissue damage in subsequent dis 
dislocations, so so they they are less less painful. So the labrum and the capsule of the joint will be torn in a dislocation. And there are also associated injuries to the rotator cuff muscles. And these structures lend stability to the shoulder joint. So since they are injured, the shoulder will subsequently be at greater risk to dislocate again. So Francis, we have a picture of the x-ray. If we can bring that up, please. I think every week I give you a picture of an x-ray, whether you want it or not. Well, actually, I think people like that. Um, so I hope people like the pictures. So let us know if you enjoy that. So while we're waiting for that, I'll just keep going. And then, oh, oh there it. we go. Yeah. yeah, I see it now. So the picture on the right shows a shoulder that is good. It's the proper positioning. It's optimal positioning of the ball in the socket. Then you can see the picture to the left, how the, the ball does, is not where it belongs. You can see the socket above, and uh, the ball is not in contact with the socket. So this would obviously need to be dealt with fairly emergently. So some of the complications that we're looking at with a shoulder dislocation, in addition, obviously, to those um, potential soft tissue tears that we talked about just minutes ago. Um, so there is a relatively high incidence of fracture. So up to 25% of patients will have a fracture after a dislocation. So that is pretty high. And that's one of the reasons why usually after a dislocation, they will do x-rays. Um, there's also something called a hill sacs lesion. Do we have a picture of that, Francis? And 75% of people with dislocations will end up with a hill sax. And basically, what that is, is a compression fracture of the ball. There you go. So yeah, you can just see there, there's almost a divot. All these golf analogies today, but a, a divot in the, the humeral head. And that's just because of the impact that it's made up against the socket when it's dislocated. So you just think of, of the uh, forces involved to do that. So 75% of people with dis dislocations will have a hill sax. And that's one of the ways we'll also tell if someone had a dislocation that they were able to reduce on their own is if they, they come in, they're x-rayed, they have that hill sack, you're like, well, they probably did dislocate. We're going to talk about that later. So nerve damage is another potential complication, and this can be very devastating. I've only ever seen it once, but it was horrible for this individual. So often the, uh, the most commonly the nerve that's damaged is the auxiliary nerve, um, and that is the nerve that innervates your deltoid. So when people damage their auxiliary nerve, they no longer have control and function of their deltoid. And, you know, you just think about the function of the shoulder raising the arm. That's highly compromised after this happens. So the first sign of this is typically that people will have a numb patch right there. And if people have that after shoulder dislocation, I get pretty nervous. Um, so we need to recognize that. And again, because there are implications with the deltoid. So older patients who dislocate will often tear their rotator cuffs. Um, so that's obviously an issue. Um, and rare complications of shoulder dislocations, thank goodness, because they're quite serious, um, include tearing of the auxiliary artery. So that's an artery that's kind of in your armpit area that supplies blood to the arm. So that can obviously be quite devastating. Um, and as well as brachial plexus injuries. And what the brachial plexus is, is a bundle of nerves that connects the nerves in your arm to the nerves in your spinal cord. So if that gets injured, obviously, there's some pretty big implications as well. And we're going to talk a little bit later about how we do not want you, if you dislocate your shoulder, to try to put it back in place yourself. And this would be why. We don't want those structures to be damaged. And a really, really common um, side effect, I shouldn't say side effect, but secondary injury with a dislocation is a tear of that labrum, which is, again, just a little, little cup that deepens the sockets made out of cartilage. So that's, and again, when you lose, lose the um, integrity of the labrum, it really does affect shoulder stability in the long term. So Francis, what groups in ter are, are most at risk, would you say, of <clears throat> dislocation? Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, the higher incidence are in, uh, for shoulder dislocation are in males than females. Uh, in males, the peak of age of in incidence will be between 20 and 30 years old and uh, with a male to female ratio of nine to one. Um, and in females, the peak of age of incidence will be between 61 and 80 years old, uh, with a, fem a female to male ratio of three to one. Now, in older adults, uh, collagen fiber found in the inner layer that Jian showed you uh, just earlier uh, that we've talked above, um, 
have fewer crosslinks and making the joints capsule and supporting tendons and ligaments weaker and dislocation more likely. Uh, shoulder dislocation occur more frequently in, a, in adolescence um, than in younger children because the weaker growth plates uh, in children tend to fracture before dislocate, uh, dislocation occurs. Now, Gianns, what are the type of dislocations? So we have three. So by far the most common is an anterior dislocation. And what that means is we have our socket here, the ball here, and the ball comes forwards. So that is 85 to 98%, I believe, yeah, of um, dislocations are our anterior. Um, we also have posterior dislocations. They are usually a result of electrocution, actually or um, seizures, so they're not very common. I have though seen them um, in cases where people have been bench pressing loads that they're unable to control and the bar drives the shoulder backward and then usually they end up with the, the back part of the labrum being torn. We do see them, but they're not very common. And then the third is an inferior dislocation. And what happens with that is that the ball goes down in the socket and that can result usually from traction on the arm. So that's why we shouldn't be yanking on people's arms. It's not ideal for sure. So um, in terms of signs and symptoms, I don't think there are many of us walking around with shoulder dislocations who don't know it. It's not like, oh, wow, you know, surprise. So obviously there's severe pain. Um, often there's muscle spasm, which will make, make it difficult or impossible to move the arm. Um, there's often a visible deformity, which I believe we have a picture of as well. Yeah. And yeah. then... You can also have swelling and bruising of the shoulder or the upper arm, and the swelling and bruising will often track downwards thanks to gravity. And then a very, very common thing is numbness or weakness of the into the hand. Oftentimes people, and again, just because that brachial plexus, all those nerves are right in that area. There we go. So you can see that individual's right shoulder, which is on the left side of your screen, that's been dislocated, whereas the other side looks much better. So visible deformity, lots of pain, lots of spasm. Um, people sometimes will even go into a bit of shock symptoms if it, this is an acute situation. So nausea, vomiting, sweating, lightheadedness, weakness um, can be quite common as well. So like we talked about before, sometimes the shoulder, so what we call a, a joint that's put back in place, we call that a reduction or reducing the joint. So sometimes the shoulder will go back into place or reduce on its own. When it doesn't, a reduction, like I said, is required. And this usually involves a trip to the emergency room. Um, so due to the protective muscle spasm that occurs after a dislocation, because again, we talked about, we've got those two layers of muscles, the outer layer is really, really powerful. And those muscles will, will spasm to try to protect the area. So often it's not possible to just ram the joint back into place without a little bit of help. So oftentimes they'll have to use sedation to um, calm those muscles down to be able to move the shoulder back into its position and reduce it. So like I said before, please, 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 if there's one thing you remember from this, please do not be reducing shoulder dislocations by yourself or having your friend do it. The risk of nerve and blood vessel damage is too great. And obviously your friend or yourself, you don't have sedation to use. So for safety purposes, I think it's really important to have this done by a professional. It's, it's not like something to be joking around with. So Francis, in terms of prevention, what are some suggestions that you would make? Well, <clears throat> a shoulder dislocation is very hard to, um, to well, I, I wouldn't say to prevent, but it, it is possible to, uh, to prevent that from happening again. But the first one is most likely uh, something that, that can be prevented. But like if you're playing a sports, for example, like the exterior force that comes to you, um, like if you're playing football and you're the quarterback and you want to throw the ball, this is a natural and normal uh, uh, position for throwing the football. But if somebody tackle you from behind, um, that's going to create a dislocation or could create a dislocation. So it's very hard to prevent that if it's the first time, if you never had that before. So the first thing is to cross fingers and uh, try not saying not playing sports. It's just it can happen. But um, following, once you have that, once you have a, a dislocation, if we put it back together and we're saying, okay, there's no fracture, there's nothing bad, everything is good in your shoulder, you still have to do some f uh, physical therapy treatment. So if you follow what the physiotherapist gives you by the letter and 
like we are um we've been in the in the field for a lot of years so we know gian will probably agree with me people will start doing the activity that the military will uh the, the physiotherapist uh, will give you but after a couple of weeks we're gonna stop doing we're not gonna be as uh as um normal uh, as um we're gonna we're not gonna respect the plan that the physiotherapist will give us so we're gonna stop after we don't feel the pain anymore we're kind of like satisfied over flexibility that we have and we'll be like i want to go back to uh, what i was doing before but it's very important to continue till the end the physical therapy treatment that the physiotherapist gives you because you don't want this to happen again you don't want to have a weak shoulder and you want to uh, uh, have some mobilization and also flexibility and stability in your shoulder for uh, when you're going to go back to what you were doing before. If you were playing football, for example, in that, in that case, uh, you want to make sure that when you're going to go back to the sports, you're going to be 100% ready and uh, you're not going to have another uh, shoulder injury. There's also stretching the posterior capsule of your shoulder uh, to make sure that the ball is centered in the socket. Um, maintaining adequate strength. So the rotator cuff, the, 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 the famous uh, rotator cuff exercise that we'll show you. I'm pretty sure I never like uh, showed that exercise to a person and he, he didn't know that what, what, what that exercise was. Um, so I think everybody knows these exercises, but do you do it? So that's important to make sure that you're doing these exercises, the scapular muscles also. Uh, dynamic warm ups, that is also good even if you're not injured. You got to do some dynamic warm up to get your muscle ready or actually your MSK ready for what you're about to do. And uh, wearing proper uh, protective equipment while playing sports. What are the treatments, Gian? So if somebody gets a dislocation shoulder, what, what is the physiotherapist treatment? Well, the, the first thing with this is really, really important is immobilization. I would say we emphasize immobilization of this injury probably more than any other. Um, a lot of times, you know, post-operative stuff, we're very much like get moving, get going, get out of that sling, get, you know, but in this particular situation, we really do need to immobilize these folks. So that that length of immobilization will really vary um it depends on the patient so we, we have to really find a balance between immobilizing the, the um, shoulder long enough to prevent recurrent dislocation and allowing that soft tissue to firm up but we also don't want people to lose a lot of range of motion if it's kept still for too long so i would say two weeks is fairly standard we actually tend to immobilize older people for a shorter period of time because their risk of a frozen shoulder is greater. So I would often immobilize a younger person, maybe maybe up to four weeks. An older person may be coming out of that sling after one week. It just kind of varies on, just depending on your situation. So the sling, in addition to helping the structures heal, it also is just a bit of a reminder to us that, hey, I better not be reaching that arm out to, to you know, grab the door or, or what have you. So it's just a, a, just a bit of a, a safety net. And it also allows the muscles that have been in spasm and trying to protect that arm, it allows them to relax. So they don't have to be holding that arm up against gravity as that other soft tissue heals. So in the acute phase of this, um, obviously we're immobilizing people, we're trying to get their pain and their swelling under control just to, to aid in, in our healing time. So that's kind of our first priority. In the subacute phase, we're working on strengthening usually first that, that middle layer, so the rotator cuff, activating the cuff muscles. And at this stage, pain control is really important. So whether that's done through medication or modalities or what have you, pain control is really important because the rotator cuff will not activate properly unless the pain is controlled. So it will be defacilitated de and almost impossible to strengthen. So you're kind of banging your head up against the wall. Um, so, and then, then we go from there into adding on top of the rotator cuff strength, uh, the larger muscle group. So in that outer layer, we talked about things like your deltoid and your pectorals and that kind of thing. So, um, we, I find personally in my experience with shoulder dislocations, for which a lot of them are, are young military members, I don't actually find I have to do a lot of range of motion stuff with people. Usually the dislocation has happened because they're already hyper or excessively mobile. And I find usually their range of motion comes back fine without me actually having to push it, which I don't want to do. If it, if it comes back on its own, let's let it do that. But, you know, 
as um, basically with the rotator cuff and the exercise programs, what we do is we start with everything is very much by the side at a neutral position. And then as people improve their control, their neuromuscular control, then we start doing rotator cuff stuff in more challenging positions. So sometimes even getting them close to that dislocation position. So if they go there again, their muscles know how to save them or how to stop that. So um, <clears throat> yeah, so that's kind of generally speaking uh, what we do. And, you know, some people with this do need surgery. Um, some patients, you know, to, especially if they're repeat dislocators, they will, some of them will go on to um, require surgery. One of the biggest predictive factors for folks that will go on to need surgery is age. So the, the younger the age of the first dislocation, the higher the likelihood that people will need surgery. So if you're going to dislocate your shoulder, try to put it off as long as you can. That's, that's kind of a, a good point there for that. So the, the decision to do surgery usually depends on the extent of the damage to the joint or that inner layer that we talked about, as well as the type of activities that the individual wants to resume. So I may dislocate my shoulder, but not really have very big aspirations of, of doing contact sports, whereas someone else might have exactly the same injury, but their requirements for what they want to do are greater. So surgery is not 100% based on the pathology. It's also based on your personal goals and what your lifestyle is like. Um, so yeah, basically it's an individualized, uh, decision for each patient. So Francis, did you want to talk a little bit about the reconditioning process, what you do with these folks when they're done with me? Sure do. Um, I want to bring back a question that, uh, Gabriel asked, um, about, uh, you did answer Gabriel. I uh, just want to make sure that everybody know what's that acronym. Uh, so Gabriel asked, like, what kind of activities uh, in the armies, uh, in the army, sorry, could put you at, at risk? Uh, Gian hit the right spot for Wainwright because we do have CQC, which is close quarter combat. So basically, uh, any kind of martial arts can bring you into a dislocation uh, shoulder. Actually, martial arts also use uh, type of techniques to dislocate parts of your body. So uh, the elbow one with Ronda Rousey, you probably know that. Um, you saw it pretty much in every of her fights <laughs> that she did in her career. But um, yeah, it can happen when you do some martial arts and CQC is pretty much close quarter combat. So it's pretty much martial arts. It can happen over there. Uh, here in Wainwright, we do have CQC and DP1. So that's why we see a lot of case like that. I would say also to add on that question, any kind of sports that you do with unit PT, uh, when you're not used to that sports, you're pretty much vulnerable. For example, basketball, if you play with people who don't really play basketball, um, when you jump to the net to go grab the ball, you might be in a vulnerable position because your arm will be fully extended. Somebody can fall or just go down while you're going up. So it might create... Um, that dislocate that, that dislocation um any kind of sports that you're not used to play you you're going to be kind of vulnerable to it you need to learn the basics um and uh just be careful like don't push yourself too much competition um in the military is very popular so people like even during unit pt they like to challenge themselves and they're going to create a competition environment uh if you're not somebody who play that sports really often I would say you might be putting yourself into a vulnerable situation because of the competition. You want to win, so you're going to do anything in your power to win. Um, I, I we, we didn't really see it yet. Um, I don't hope to see that in Wainwright. But, uh, for example, playing dodgeball, if you run for the ball and then you want to go grab the ball before the person grabs it for you, um, like in, uh, in, instead of you. So, you like, it's the competition environment that can create that other that or other than that um, i've seen a couple that have been have fallen and caught themselves mm -hmm. and ended up with dislocations that way particularly linemen that are doing a lot of work on ladders i've seen a couple <clears throat> that way um but even things as simple as a slip and fall on the ice can do it see a few in hockey of course um, but i'd say if i was to pick one thing it would be cqc oh yeah for sure yeah, in sure. Wainwright, because we see a lot of the CQC and yeah. it's like a ongoing course all the time. So we see a lot of CQC, uh, but you hit the right spot, Gian, like the, the way we fall, if we don't learn and yes, we can learn how to fall. Um, we can prevent a lot of injuries. Most of the people who falls um, unexpected, obviously, because it's always unexpected. 
you're always going to like try to protect yourself but the way you protect yourself to to the fall will create an injury you will you can break your wrists you can uh, break a bone actually uh your coccyx or even have a concussion or even create a dislocate the uh, dislocation so it's always good to uh, learn how to fall and i like martial arts because they teach you that um when you start a new martial arts they will teach you how to fall because that's going to happen really often in that sport you're probably going to be always on the, on the ground so it's good to know how we fall in all the other sports we can learn also um, that's what I do when I teach hockey uh, to people. I make them fall on the ice because you're going to fall on the ice and you need to know how to fall. So n knowing these stuff will prevent you from, uh, it's not preventing at 100%, but it will decrease the chance of having a dislocated shoulder. So with that said, <clears throat> after you guys uh, are done with the physiotherapist, you will also come uh, see me, the reconditioning specialist. So like I, I'm always saying in all the podcasts that we're doing, we always, well, our goal as exercise physiologists, we want to bring you back to your uh, occupational duty or even your sports that you like to do, but even better. We want you to put, like if you did have that injury before and it was a preventable injury, we're going to make sure that it won't, this problem will be fixed. So that's our first goal. So basically what the physiotherapist will give you, we will continue uh, these exercises because you need to gain back your range of motion. Having your full range of motion, your strength, and also your, your um, mobility in your, in your shoulder will be uh, an objective or goal that we want to do. Um, there are some exercises that I like to, um, uh, to go. Uh, with uh, to show you guys um, e these exercise uh, that we're showing you guys today it's uh, good to just do it by yourself you can do it at home with no equipment um, that's not a problem because of the situation that we're having right now but uh, at the gym we do have all the equipment so you can use all the equipment that you need let me sh uh, share my screen or share my screen now that's not an exercise <clears throat> See here, um, these these exercises are pretty good. You have the first one here uh, at the top that we like to uh, give uh, to the people. It's you put yourself in the push-up position and you're gonna do the clock uh, work, which means both hand together on the mat and then you're gonna do the clock. So one o'clock, two o'clock, three o'clock till you get to 12 o'clock. And then once, if you can see me on the screen, when your arms goes on the other side uh, to do the nine o'clock or 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock, you see that there's a lot of like flexibility and, and uh, stretching that you're gonna do in your shoulder. So it's good because that's gonna help you to regain that uh, mobility, that, that strength. And then once you've done the 12 o'clock, you can do it backward um, just to have like a full rotation of your shoulder on both sides. And obviously you're gonna do both arms because the other arm is jealous. So that is a really good exercise I like to give to people. If it's too hard, <clears throat> when you start that, that exercise, um, you can obviously put your knees on the floor instead of uh, having a full push-up position. And uh, if uh, still this is too hard, you can decrease by doing uh, only one rotation on one side. So just one to 12, not 12 to one. Um, and then you're gonna increase progressively your intensity with that exercise. Um, the, the second exercise, I'll go quicker or faster with all the others, but the second exercise is very good because that's going to work on your shoulder mobility and the flexibility. So you basically go on your knees and uh, you're going to uh, put your hands behind your head and then you're going to rotate back. So that's going to like stretch the floor, um, your shoulder. And then when you do the other exercise, which is putting your hands in your lower back and you're going to rotate you're going to also feel the upper of your shoulders stretching so these two exercises it's like one picture but you see two exercises in that picture um the ytwl that is an exercise that you can do it in various position um the most popular one is laying on your back um and you're just basically doing the ytwl and at all time you want to make sure that your wrists, your elbow, and your shoulders 
uh, are on the ground the whole time. So you see sometimes people who don't have that flexibility, the, the wrists, um, if I turn myself, the wrist will be forward, like forward like this and they don't have that flexibility, they don't have that range of motion. So obviously when you're laying on your back, the gravity can help you to increase that flexibility and go back to your uh, normal rotation, normal range of motion that you had before. So that's why I like to do it uh, uh, laying on your back. You can obviously do it uh, even standing, but it's up to you uh, the way you want to do it. And you just do the four exercises. You do the four letters and you go slow the whole time. So from the Y, you go to the T, sorry, Y to the T, and then the W and then the L. And you're trying to have uh, these three joints uh, always touching the surface. Um, the other two exercises are uh, shoulder stabilization. So the med ball uh, of death. A little bit, that's a little bit pushing, but yeah, the med ball def is just putting your uh, med ball overhead, and then you're trying to have that range of motion that you had before, and you come back up. Um, and the third one, obviously, if you do have a kettlebell that big, you, unless you're Hulk, um, that is very big as a as a kettlebell. Uh, ours at the gym, that's pretty much 70 pounds to 80 pounds. Obviously, you're going to take. Uh, um, a smaller kettlebell but what's really important on that picture I don't know if I can zoom in yeah that's that's really good so you can see that the ball of the kettlebell is above the head the hand above the wrists and I like that I like that because if you do try it you'll see that your shoulder will be trying to stabilize the whole time well not shaking like I'm doing right now but I'm just exaggerating right now and that helps you to uh, reinforce that uh, joint stability in your shoulder. So that's the one. There's also the plank. That's really good. I couldn't put that plank into these exercise uh, because of space, but uh, yeah, there you go. That's a really good exercise to stabilize your, uh, your shoulder uh, girdle. Um, yeah, so these are the, the exercises that you can do at home. They don't require a lot of equipment. If you don't have a kettlebell, that's all right. You can grab anything that has a weight and you put it in your hand and then you do the same exercise. Um, I don't know if you wanted to show the pictures of the rotator cuff, Jan. Is it, uh, or do you want to wait a little bit for that? Uh, I think we lost Jan. <laughs> She's, uh... so I'll do it. I'll explain it. Um, the rotator cuff that we have here um, are, uh, these are the exercises that we were talking about earlier. So these exercises, you will see it with Jian way before me. So uh, we do this exercise, obviously, with the reconditioning program, but you are already in the process with this. So it's basically a 90 degree rotation. And all the four exercises you see here, they are all um, exercise doing the 90 degree rotation, but it will be on um, a different motion. So the first one that you see here is, uh, I call this one the Aladdin. So you just put your arms like this and you do the Aladdin movement. The second one is like throwing a, uh, throwing a ball. So you're doing the same motion. And then the other two is reverse. So you're just doing the reverse of the first two. So the force will be on the opposite side. What's really important with these uh, exercises, it's uh, we prefer starting these exercises with a band, so with a TeraBand or any kind of elastic, just because the more you pull on an elastic, the more resistance that you will have on the joint. So um, it's better. I, I feel that um, you feel the shoulder working more, uh, the more you're going to, increase uh, the like the more you stretch the band the more it's going to increase the, uh, um, the the power on the exercise so these exercises are really good to go to, to do also and that can be done um, with the physiotherapist treatment obviously uh, she will probably most of the time give you some therabands to do at home um, if uh, you have to do these exercises because they're pretty good for that um, so there you go. These are the exercises that we need to do um, as a reconditioning, and this is a really focus on your shoulder. Um, but obviously, there's other exercises that we do uh, to more narrow your shoulder back to the activity that you were doing before. So if you like to do any 
um, uh, sports, we're going to focus on that sports and uh, do some recondi reconditioning towards that. Um, so yeah, Gianna explained the rotary cuff um, exercises. So yeah, we kind of find out that you were uh, frozen. <laughs> yeah, I, I disappeared. Yeah, I asked you a question and you didn't even answer. <laughs> so yeah, that's sorry. all right. I um, just would like to emphasize that the program, the reconditioning stuff that is quite advanced, like people wouldn't start working on that until they were finished with me and moved on to Francis. So we're looking at probably about four months post. So I wouldn't suggest that people, you know, a week or two, you know, you're just coming out of your sling. Those wouldn't be a great starting place. Just just to clarify before someone gets themselves in trouble. And also so, yeah. uh, we had a person who asked um, taping. So I know that's mm -hmm. a question that, um, People like to ask, uh, Jan and I were pretty, uh, we have a lot of knowledge into taping like KT tape or athletic tape or any kind of stuff. So the way I, I would say all my experience in taping um, in sports, I didn't do any uh, shoulder taping in my whole career um, as a taping sport with the athletic tape. The athletic tape, tape is goal is to support the joint. Um, now the shoulder, as you could see, supporting that joint who has a real uh, like a really big range of motion mm -hmm. it's very hard to support that um well, i think it's a hard to find the balance of adequate support that wouldn't limit your range of motion so excessively that you wouldn't be able to function in your sport anymore like i think for the taping to actually provide the support it needed you would be so limited in your range that you wouldn't be able to to really be effective effectively engaging anyway i have had success and i will say short-term success with the use of bracing for the shoulder um now what i would say though is my experience has been that the bracing will work to get you through a season what i have found with a lot of the folks who are so bad that they require bracing upon recovery is they usually do go on to require surgery in the off season so i would say i've, I've used bracing successfully but temporarily yeah, because it's also, <clears throat> what I was saying also, it's like really important to know that um, it's athletes who are coming to see me or GN and they're like, I want a taping, I want to go back to sport, I want to be ready and I don't feel confident my shoulder is strong enough to play that sport. Well, if you don't feel confident, you can probably not play and uh, just be, when you're going to feel confident, you're going to go back. But sometimes it's, it's um, like a, a psychological problem. So, like, I'm not saying you have a mental health problem, but it's just, like, psychologic. It's, like, it's just my brain who wants to feel uh, that support. And just to create that, there's, a, a, one taping, like, an athletic taping that I saw. There's a lot of KT tape, but KT tape does not support joints. Um, but the athletic tape takes probably two roll, uh, two big roll of athletic tape, and it don't really support you. But sometimes for the psychologic uh, part of it, it will give you the confidence to go back to play. So it depends on, on the physiotherapist that you have in front of you or the exercise physiologist or the health professional you have in front of you um, to give you like uh, the go, okay, if we do that taping, it's psychologic only. It, sometimes if you say that, the placebo effect goes away. But it's to not make that move if you know that your shoulder does not have the support itself like if if you think that the shoulder needs more reconditioning well it's a better move to say no taping and you're not coming back to play because it's better for you to still work on your reconditioning and then when you're ready you'll go back to play um anything else you want to add on that gm no, I think that's adequate. I think I do think that with the kinesio tape, there is some benefits in terms of proprioception or just sensory input to know where the joint is to keep you a little bit safer. But I mean, maybe I, I don't think that it would keep you significantly safer in a uh, contact or collision sport situation. I certainly wouldn't be banking on it myself. No, for sure. You're um, way, way, way better off to get that inner and outer layer of muscles supporting the joint for you. That's their job, and all the tape in the world is not going to compensate if they are not doing their job. Yeah. So you always want to uh, focus on these exercises before starting all the other exercises that you want to do, um, or just the taping. The taping itself, it's not a miracle here. Like, don't don't think it's a miracle. Um, 
I certainly have used taping for different shoulder problems with very good success, I would say. But this one, I mean, I, again, we're talking about usually when the shoulder dislocates, it's, it's some pretty significant loads. And I don't know, I, I just, I wouldn't be hanging my hat on that as a prevention, that's for sure. Yeah. So um, if we don't have any more questions, um, I literally forgot one question, Nepal, that uh, we... Um, that we had at the beginning of the podcast, but that's all right. We're learning here. Um, and uh, I hope you guys did appreciate uh, that podcast, the way it was presented today. So it's not live on YouTube. It's not live on Facebook. There's a lot of problem with uh, uh, these uh, these um, software, if I can say that, or platform. Um, but we're not stopping uh, putting them on YouTube or uh, uh, Facebook. You'll see that this podcast will be on that later on today um but i hope you guys did enjoy that podcast and if you do have any questions feel free to come and uh, send us an email um just just keep us informed with your questions we like questions we like to have these kind of questions they're really uh, interactive and they gave us a way to uh more um uh narrow our discussion towards what you guys want to know um we may forget uh, some stuff that uh, we want to cover, but with the limit of time, even today, it's a really long podcast. But um, in the future podcast, we want to like always short the, the podcast as much as possible. So let's hope that uh, we did answer your questions. Um, so before we leave you guys, uh, don't forget, like uh, next week, we're still going to have that podcast on Demio. But in two weeks from now, it's a big thing. It's going to really uh, be fun. Uh, we do have a special guest. It's going to be uh, an Ironman athlete. He's military. It's His name is uh, Frédéric Nalin, Warren Officer Nalin. He's uh, posted in uh, Saint-Jean-sur-Richelieu. Um, so it's going to be a bilingual podcast. Even Montreal region will be uh, part of it. Um, they want to jump into that podcast and just be with that podcast. So don't miss it. Um, it's in two weeks from now. Um, and uh, also next week, hey, don't forget our podcast, our weekly podcast. Um, but yeah, so uh, feel free to share that uh, that link to everybody if you think that they're gonna uh, have more, um, that it's gonna fit for them and they're gonna like that kind of uh, stuff to hear. So on that note, do you have anything else to add? No, I think just if anyone has any suggestions of things they'd be interested in hearing about, that would be great because sometimes I feel like I don't really know what we should do next. So, oh, God. yeah, if there's and, anything, any topic that interests anyone, just ask and we'll try to figure something out. You are so right, GM, because like we know the stuff, uh, we know this stuff where uh, the knowledge is there, but the goal of that podcast is to give knowledge to everybody. So, if the thing that you want to hear from us, uh, we will think about it in probably like uh, five podcasts from now. So you, you have to wait five podcasts. That's not fun. So if you send us like ideas, like I would like you to, to talk about that. Um, and we will be more than happy to talk about this topic. So yeah, like, uh, like Jan said, like uh, send us an email saying Francis or Jan. Can you guys talk about that topic next week? I just had an injury. That's the injury. I would like you guys to cover it. Yeah, let's let's do this. So I'd be more than happy to do that. Awesome. All right. So see you guys uh, next week for another podcast on Demio. So thanks everybody uh, to come here and uh, uh, like be live with us on on Demio. So uh, see you guys next week. Bye everyone. Thanks. Bye.